sound and logical. Let's get into this one. Bible, solar myths. Listen, people have said, what's happened with this guy? How come he's, he's, he's changed his direction? I haven't changed any direction, you know. I've always been on the direction of truth. I thought the historicity of all these things was correct. It's recently I found out it's not correct when I started to look at it objectively from the scholarly realm. Not the parishioner, church, church pews, but outside of that. That's when I realized, hold up, wait a minute, something is just not right. You understand? So I can't live in myth if that's not reality. So this one here is called Bible and Solar Myths. When I did this presentation, I don't care if you don't like me anymore or whatever the case may be, your personal feelings or grievances. Just jot no, as they say in Jamaica. I'm not the one who lied, you know. Someone's lying. It's not me. But I appreciate when you are introduced to truth, it gets scary when you've been finding out that certain things aren't legit. You understand? So bear that in mind too. You can throw all the stones you want. It's fine. I'm used to it. But at the same time, do your due diligence to check the facts. Not the beliefs, R. Kelly, but the facts. Facts over fiction. Now let's get into this one very quick. I'm going to be sharing a few quotes from scholars, not pastors, preachers, mores, churches, all that kind of stuff, those business schemes. None of them people there. Just going to be looking at what the scholars say, the critics say, regarding some of the stories. Then we're going to see if there's any credibility to what they're saying. Or are they saying stuff that is invalid? So we want to stick on what is real and what is not real. What is fact, what is not fact. What is authenticated, what is not authenticated. We're not dealing with belief and believing and circular reasoning, throwing out a thousand scriptures within a, novel, within a narrative to support a narrative. We're going to look at what a critic says and if there's any substance in what they're saying. All right? That's where we're going today. Let's get into this one. Everybody ready? All right, let's go. So previously I was showing you um, connections with civil rights and the, the motif of Moses and the Passover and slavery and the narrative. Now, if the Exodus account is not true, if Moses isn't even a real person, then that whole narrative is a big, massive psyop. If the Exodus is a myth, there's no second Exodus. So William Doan, he says, the author of the religion of Israel, speaking of Samson, says the story of Samson and his deeds originated in a solar myth. So he's saying, Samson originates in a solar myth. Now let's see if there's any facts behind that statement. Which was afterwards transformed by the narrator into a saga about a mighty hero and deliverer of is ra -El. The very name Samson is derived from the Hebrew word and means sun. The hero's flowing locks were originally the rays of the sun and other traces of the old myth have been preserved. So when you look into the name Samson, remember I told you a lot of people will say Shalom, Shalawam, all that kind of stuff. That's a Canaanite deity of peace. It's a Canaanite deity of how you greet somebody in the morning. It's just all the old world was linked to gods or linked to stars, linked to constellations. That's how they spoke. So he said that. Is there any facts behind that? Is there any facts behind what he's just said? So if you go to Samson and you go to the concordance, it says that Samson's name is Shimshon. Shimshon. It means sunlight. So the name Samson means sunlight. All right. Now let's see some more information regarding Samson. Meaning son, a son child. Samson is a baby's name derived from the Hebrew word Shamesh. Shamesh, which is the same as Shamesh when you start to understand all these different gods in the pantheon. It's interesting. Meaning son or son child, a strong masculine name with important religious connotations. Samson appears in the Hebrew Bible as a champion of the Israelites. Psalm 19, 4-6 In them have he set a tabernacle for the son, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. 
His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So there's nothing hid from the heat of the sun. <laughs> Interesting. But Samson's name means sun child or sun light. Did you know that? So according to what he's just said, is there any credibility in what he's saying? That Samson's based off solar myth, solar mythology. The most complete and rounded off solar myth extant in Hebrew is that of Shimshon, Samson, a cycle of myth, mythical conception fully comparable with the Greek myth of Hercules. Go to Torah.com. They don't even hide away from the fact. <laughs> Samson's name, Shimshon, recalls the common noun used for sun, as well as the proper noun that serves as the name of a solar deity in several Semitic languages, such as Akkadian sun god, Samas. As the ending sound on is a diminutive, his name means something like little sun, or if he is meant to be a demigod, son of the sun. <laughs> Bro, it's there, man. Uh, a fake but unmistakable echo of his name, Link is found to the Babylonian Talmud. You know, it talks about Samson was named with a name of the Holy One, blessed be he, as it says, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The evidence has suggested to many scholars that the underlying biblical Samson story is a myth about a solar deity impregnating a mortal woman. When you look at how his mom had to go through certain um, prohibitions in able to conceive Samson, it has the motif of a solar myth. When you look at a lot of the solar myth stories, a deity impregnates a woman or a woman becomes impregnated by following certain things. And then she has a child who is, has miraculous strength or some sort of godlike quality, blah, 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 blah. These are common traditions that you find in a motif. The evidence has suggested too many scholars, but the underlying, the biblical Samson story is a myth about a solar deity impregnating a mortal woman and giving birth to a demigod. In fact, hints of Samson's demi-divine origin can be seen in the opening story about his conception which insinuates the possibility of impregnation by a divine male figure. Very, very interesting, this Samson story. Very, 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 very interesting. Now, is there any facts behind that? You see, when the truth comes out and facts come out, a lot of religious believing people do an exodus. I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. Let's just stay with things that are relevant and factual. Facts. Don't be telling your children not to believe in a tooth fairy, but then you're believing in myths as if they're facts. Let's see some more stuff. As part of the great solar tradition that can be found in many places, the peoples of the ancient Near and Middle East revered a wide variety of sun deities, including the Babylonian Shamash and the god of the fathers, as well as the Canaanite goddess Shapash. These deities possess numerous divine epithets and attributes adopted by biblical figures such as Yahweh, Samson, and Jesus. There you see an old school picture of Samson. Very interesting. The idea of calling the second person in the Trinity, Logos, or Word, is an Egyptian feature and was engrafted into Christianity many centuries after the time of Christ Jesus. Apollo, who had his tomb at Delphi in Egypt, was called the Word. Apollo has been recognized as a god of archery, music, dance, truth, and prophecy, healing, and diseases. The sun and the light poetry are more. One of the most important and complex of the Greek gods, he is the son of Zeus and Leto, and the twin brother of Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Apollo is mostly known for being the god of the sun and the light, but he is. Apollo originates from the Greek word apella, which means a sheep fold. So Apollo, the word, in the beginning was the word, the word, the word. You see the word a lot in other mythologies too. That whole breakdown of word this and word that, you can find that in other mythologies too. So is there any credence to what he's just said? Interesting. So Helios was a titan god of the sun, a guardian of oaths. Helios, the god of the sun, and Apollo, the god of light and justice, who was often conflated with Helios, Roman mythology worshipped Helios 
a soul. Now, going back to that point that we made about Samson and his hair being linked to the sun. So Mithras, who was a mediator between God and man, was called the savior. He was the peculiar God of the Persians who believed that he had, by his suffering, worked their salvation. And on this account, he was called their savior. He was also called the Logos or the word. This phraseology, the word, is not an exclusive Christian term. A lot of the things that Christianity uses, they take from other cultures, demonize it, and then tell you not to look that way. But we're going to look at things from a scholastic level to see if there's any facts behind what people are saying. All right, let's continue, let's advance. So, let's look at the word Lazarus. Lazarus. So Lazarus comes from the Egyptian. La Asuras. La Asuras. In India, the sun is called Soraya or Asuraya. All right. Now the word Lazarus means God has helped. Now Soraya in Hinduism can mean both the sun or the sun, God. Lazarus. Interesting. Lazarus come forth. Now, I know many people are aware of the story of Moses. It's a smash hit. It does well on Netflix. It does well in all the churches. It does well. In fact, the, the, the Bible character Moses, um, he's worth a lot in terms of marketing. Like that character alone is worth a lot. But there is a story that predates the Moses story in the basket and all that kind of stuff. And there's a story called Kana, which you find in the Hindu text or the Indian text. or the Mar Have you pronounced it? Marababata. Now in this story... A virgin is impregnated by the sun god Sarai Yah. In shame, the child is sent down the river and found by a charioteer, who is a, a low caste, who finds him or who makes him into a man of war. This child, Karna, who would before uh, become a major warrior in the Mahabrata. <laughs> Mahabrata, yeah? So this is very interesting. You realize there's a lot of stories that are just... The same story retold for another audience in another way. So look into that one. Look into Karna. Look into Perseus. All right. So our next one then. To, to summarize, in the Gilgamesh tale, we have a hero or leader, Masu, climbing the holy mountain, Mashu, in order to emulate the path of the solar legislator, Shamash. Much like Moses or Moshe in the myth. So Moses goes to the mountain, he gets the law, the law is given to him from this, that and the other. Most stories you find the character going to a mountain to talk to the deity to get some laws or some commandments or some... A dialogue regarding how to rule people. You find it in a lot of the mythologies to go to the mountain. Most of the gods are named the Most High because they sit on a very high mountain. Mount Olympus, Mount Moriah. In the story of Shamash, there's a mountain. You always see these mountains because it's a motif, it's a pattern in mythologies that you all follow a certain pattern. But let's continue, let's advance. The ancient Egyptians also had the legend of the tree of life. It is mentioned in their sacred books that Osiris ordered the names of some souls to be written on this tree of life, the fruit of which made those who ate it to become as gods. Do me a favor, is there any lagging? Put a one, if there's no lagging, then it is what it is, thank you. So the ancient Egyptians also had the legend of the tree of life. It is mentioned in the sacred books that Osiris ordered the names of some souls to be written on this tree of life. The fruit of which made those who ate it to become as gods. When the Spanish missionaries first set foot upon the soil of America in the 15th century, they were amazed to find that the cross was as devoutly worshipped by the Red Indians as by themselves. The hallowed symbol challenged their attention on every hand and in almost every variety of form. And what is still more remarkable the cross was not only associated with other objects corresponding in every particular with those delineated on Babylonian monuments, but it was also distinguished by the Catholic appellation, 
the tree of sustenance, the wood of health, the emblem of life. Interesting. So when the Spanish missionaries went to the Americas, they found the Indians, the Red Indians, um, already knowing or aware of this cross symbol, linked back to Babylon, linked to the tree of life, linked to this, linked to that. And they were astonished. They thought they were going to bring them something new, but they already knew. Tertullian, a Christian father of the second and third centuries, writing to the pagans, says, the origins of your God is derived from the figures molded on a cross. I'll say that again. The origin of your gods is derived from figures molded on a cross. We have it then, but on the authority of a Christian father, as late as AD 211, that the Christians neither adored crosses nor desired them, but that the pagans adored crosses and that and not that alone, but a cross with a man upon. So in Asia, got a man on a cross. Europe, man on a cross. Africa. And if you look on the bottom of the Africa individual, um, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the name now, but you can see a circle and you can see a cross as well. You might say it's a Knights Templar cross, but it's actually, it's not that. That was, what's the word when you take something that belongs to somebody else? Repurposed. That symbol there is a solar symbol. And it also has four points, north, south, east and west. It's interesting. But yeah, a lot of that stuff there is interesting. The, 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 the demonization of anything that wasn't considered Christian is also very interesting. But let's continue, let's advance. Maya the mother of Buddha and Devaki, the mother of Krishna, were worshipped as virgins and represented with their infant son saviors in their arms, just as the virgin of the Christians is represented at the present day. So you have in China, Buddha, India, Krishna, and Judea, Christ. Very interesting. Dean Millman, in his history, of Christianity, volume 1, page 97, refers to the tradition found among the Chinese that Fohai was born of a virgin and remarks that the first Jesuit missionaries who went to China were appalled at finding in the mythology of that country a counterpart of the story of the virgin of Judea. So there is man like Fohai born of immaculate conception, a mythological story in the culture within a place in China. Missionaries went there and were flabbergasted at Hao. They've gone there and they keep finding, so they've gone to America, the Indians have already have a system <laughs> that, they, that they're trying to demonize. They go to this side of the world, the Chinese already have a system or a culture based off mythology to give morals and guidance and understanding and stuff like that. But it's like, everyones they're coming with this new approach, but it's already been done. I guess copy strikes were not available. <laughs> Arius, the presbyter, or the pastor, the bishop, the presbyter of whom we have spoken in chapter, as declaring that in the nature of things, a father must be older than his son was excommunicated for his so-called heretical notions concerning the Trinity. If you said something that went against church folk, not just church folk, because church folk are just sheep, because that's what they called, pastors or a shepherd, and a shepherd has to have sheep, which is a very insulting in my opinion. I don't like no one being called a sheep. But anyway, aside from that though, <coughs> this presbyter, said, listen, I think a father should be older than his son in this Trinity framework, and he was excommunicated for his so-called heretical notions concerning the Trinity. Excommunicated is when you get silenced, when you get blacklisted. When you go against the status quo, you have to get silenced. Back in the day, they used to cut out people's tongues to shut them up. 
Interesting. Nowadays, they just do other little things to shut you up. You understand? But imagine that though. That seems pretty sensible. You have this trinity thing, yeah? There's three gods in one or one god in three and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, he's saying, hold up, maybe the father would be older than the son. And they say, no, they're all the same age. In the beginning, there was, they're all started in the beginning. Where's the mom as well? I always find it interesting. Where's the mom? There's just a dad and his son. But where's the mom? If we're made in the image of God, male and female, where's the lady? It's a little bit funny. But I ain't gonna try to upset people too much because truth can upset people. But why is the woman missing from the pantheon of the Hebrew uh, mythology? She wasn't always missing. But that's neither here or there. So this guy here got excommunicated. That means just go away, shut your mouth, stop, mark him, brand him, kick him out the church. And it was a serious thing when you got kicked out of the church back in those days. All right? Very interesting. Now let's continue. So pre-Islam, you had a lunar trinity. You had a lunar trinity. The Arab world, they had a trinity or a triad. And their trinity was Al-Usa, Al-Lat, and Manat. And it was just the three phases of the moon, the waxing moon, waning moon, full moon, but just different phases of the moon and you can see the symbol looks like the trinity which you find in christianity then you have in hinduism you have the triad three faces three sides of the deity then you have in christian hebrew theology eschatology a diagram of the trinity the christian solar deity or solar trinity you understand very interesting but this guy was just saying in this whole trinity thing Shouldn't the father be more superior than the son? Or shouldn't the father be more older than the son? And he was excommunicated for that. This just shows you how crazy things were back in the day. And still today. Alright, so. Again, I'm not lying to people. I have no reason to lie to people. I'm, I don't call myself pastor because I don't want no sheep. People need to think. That's it. Stop making people emotionally blackmail you, hoodwink you, curse you, and then you fulfill a self-fulfilling prophecy thinking you're cursed because you're believing in gods from a pantheon of the Canaanites. I'm not saying the Canaanites were wicked either. That's just Bible sabotage of a lot of people. They sabotage a lot of people in these Bible books. Truth be told, the Bible books are rubbing people's cultures. And the Bible book isn't even, hey, we'll get to the Bible book and how it was made. Check out the King James Bible and the translators if you haven't already. Anyway, back to this though. So we see there's always been this trinity, triad. It's always been a normal thing. Generally speaking, it just means sun, moon and stars as well. It's the constellations. All right, let's continue, let's advance. We have also an Indian legend, which relates that a curtain named Bidumanti turned back the streams of the river Ganges. We see then that the idea of the seas and rivers being divided for the purpose of letting some chosen one of God pass through is an old one peculiar to other people beside the Hebrews and the probability is that many nations had legends of this kind parting waters, splitting waters in fact didn't Elisha or was it Elijah? no Elisha split water didn't he? and Elijah maybe or did they both? so you have more than one person doing this water trick or this water gimmick but he's saying you can find this same story of people parting waters in other cultures to let chosen people pass and not let other people who are not chosen or elected pass. It's interesting. Wait a minute. Um, see me after church. There's a lie going on and it's been going on for ages and it's been probably the best lie ever. But when you step out of religion mode and belief mode, this is not to scare people. Like if my son kept believing in Santa Claus, I say, okay, that's cool. I love your belief and you're right to believe in Santa Claus. But then you have to get to a point, you say, okay, is Santa Claus real or is he invented? Did we make him up? And then you have to look at the mor morality. Why did we make him up? Was it for good reasons, bad reasons? You can debate all of that. You understand? Let's continue, let's advance with more, more, more information for you to check out and research yourself. All right, so the passage in John 1 verse 7, which reads, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, is one of the numerous interpolations 
which were inserted into the books of the New Testament. Many years after these books were written. So after these books were written, I keep telling you they were updating them like Windows software. You know how many updates are in these books? You have the books, then you have editions of the books, and they were just translating it, translating it, getting it right, getting it right, getting it better, getting it better. Every objection they had, all right, in the new edition, let's update that. Every person that got on their nerves, throw a little verse, like, bruv, they were tailoring this thing like a madness. But anyway, I'm not even a scholar. You're not even a scholar. How do you, shut up. <laughs> I had somebody say that to me. You're not a scholar, so I don't claim to be a scholar. But that don't mean I can't look into the thing like a scholar. You understand? So yeah, this, this verse, the three that bear witness and this, that, the other, this was inserted into the text at a later stage. Some earlier versions, you don't see it. Later versions, you see these things being added and added. Doesn't the Bible say, he who adds to the Bible will be cursed and he that takes away will be cursed. They always throw these little curse gimmicks in there too. The Bible has always been updated and changed and rearranged. Don't get it twisted for a microsecond. Don't be scared of the God of some pantheon. No disrespect to the God of the pantheon. I know he's cool, he's been cool. But in terms of, if you believe in this God of the pantheon from a myth, you might as well believe in Zeus, Hera, Ares, um, you might as well believe in Loki, Odin, because it's all mythology. Not saying there's not a creator, you know, but I'm saying these Hebrew story, the Hebrew story is mythology. It's just that in our Western world, dominated by certain people, you get taught it as history and fact when it's not. But let's continue though. So, Dr. Hawkers, speaking of the four Gospels and Acts, says of them, not one of these five books was really written by the person whose name it bears. And they are all, and they are all of more recent date than the reading would lead us to suppose. We cannot say that the, gos the Gospels and the book of Acts are unauthentic, for not one of them professes to give the name of its author. They appeared anonymously. The title placed above them in our Bibles owe their origin to a later ecclesiastical tradition which deserves no confidence whatever. Wow. Acts was written in Greek, presumably by Luke. You know, a lot of times you go to church, I had this beat into my head as well. You go to church, the pastor says, Luke wrote the book of Luke and Luke was a doctor and Luke, 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 they gas up Luke, yeah? And they like to gas up people, but then when you check the facts and you start to find out who wrote these books, it's, it's a vacuum. There's no nothing. No nothing. But yet we're programmed. Oh, Matthew wrote Matthew. All right, now we got all Hebrewanity mode. Matiyahu wrote this, yeah? And this Yahahu wrote this. No, they didn't. The church wrote it. Scribes wrote it, popes endorsed it, clergymen endorsed it. Acts was written in Greek, presumably by Saint Luke, the evangelist. The gospel according to Luke concludes where Acts begins, namely with Christ's ascension into the heavens. Acts was apparently written in Rome. Perhaps, see, apparently, see, at least, at least Britannic is honest, you know. Presumably, apparently, you should probably define what those words are. Presumably, apparently, perhaps, Basically, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, a whole fair man. Don't want to upset people. But truth will upset, trust me. Acts was apparently written in Rome, perhaps between 70 and 90. Though some think slightly earlier, the date is also possible. Who wrote Acts in the Bible? Acts and the Gospel of Luke make up two part work. Luke, Acts, by the same anonymous author. Traditionally, the author is believed to be Luke the Evangelist, a doctor. So you'd always like to throw that doctor thing in there too, like, you can trust Luke, he was a doctor. Well, guess what a doctor is? A doctor of divinity. <laughs> Look into the words, man. That's, these pastors are slick. Who travelled with Paul, the apostle. It is usually dated to around 80 to 90 AD, although some scholars suggest 110 to 120 AD. All right? Interesting. He's saying that one of these five books was really written by the person whose name it bears. And they are all of more recent date than the heading would lead us to suppose. The Pentateuch is ascribed in our modern translations to Moses. And he is generally supposed to be the author. This is altogether erroneous. 
as Moses had nothing whatever to do with these five books. Bishop Calenzo, speaking of this, says, The book of the Pentateuch are never ascribed to Moses in the inscriptions of Hebrew manuscripts or in printed copies of the Hebrew Bible. But what did the pastor say? Luke wrote this. Moses wrote this. Da -da 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 -da. No. Hogwash. He rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. Resurrections from the dead and ascensions into heaven are generally acknowledged to be solar features, as the history of many solar heroes agree in this particular. So when you start looking at solar myths, we will start doing a presentation on more solar myths outside of the best story ever told and sold. But solar myths have general themes. There's, there's certain things that take place in solar myths. Like Seth, no, what's his name? Set and Horus fighting every day, literally every day and night they fight and the sun resurrects every day. And then the, and then the night overtakes the sun and then the sun has to resurrect every day. Like you'll see a regular motifs in a lot of these stories that repeat and repeat and repeat. There certainly is no complete explanation to be offered by one who attempts to uphold the historical accuracy of the New Testament. Man to do but acknowledge the truth, which is that the history of Jesus of Nazareth as are related in the books of the New Testament is simply a copy of that Buddha with a mixture of mythology borrowed from other nations. The church at an early date selected the pagan festivals of sun worship for its own, ordering the birth at Christmas, a fixed time, and the resurrection at Easter, a varying time, as in all pagan traditions. Since through, since though the sun rose directly after the vernal equinox, the festival to be corrected in a pagan point of view had to be associated with the new moon. Now we're going to get into this new moon thing as well. <laughs> Listen, I can't believe it, but I still I can't believe how it's just like, wow, it's in your face after a while that it's like, okay, this is too much. It's just there. It's just facts. You get me? Mad. Anyway, so the new moon, the head of the month. That's why it can be known as the head of the month, the start of the Hebrew month, a minor Jewish festival on which fasting and mourning are not allowed. Now, in the Egyptian pantheon, you had a god called Khonsu. He had many different names. He had another name called Aya. In Egyptian mythology, he had a variety of male and female deities associated with the aspects of the moon. Likewise, in every, every religion, every nation, every religious framework or science was based upon the sun, the stars and the moon. And everyone made a name for the sun god or the moon god or the star god. It's just a way that these cultures did their thing. In Egyptian mythology, they had a variety of male and female deities associated with the aspects of the moon. As we saw in pre-Islamic, the Arab world, you have Al-Manat, this, that and the other. All about the moon. Luna, um, Luna, yeah? Egyptian mythology had a variety of male and female deities associated with the aspects of the moon. The personification of the moon was a male called Aya, also spelled Yah. But the major moon deities were Khonsu, the new moon, Toph, the full moon, also both male. So the, the the whole hype about a new moon, new moon, like it's it's not a new thing. The seventh day, it's not a new thing. In fact, a lot of these things that we think are exclusively a Hebrew framework were taken from other cultures. And to be honest, there's no doom or gloom in it. It's just simply how people live their lives based on the constellations, how they would do their ingathering season how do we do this season how to do irrigation how to do conservation it was all determined and dictated by the stars the sun and the moon so they worshipped or well not worshipped but they reverenced the sun the star or the moon and they gave them little names anyway the church at early date selected the pagan festivals of some worship for its own or during the birth of christmas at a fixed time and the resurrection at easter a varying time as in all the pagan traditions quick one when is it the most high? <laughs> when is it the most high? It's the most high at 12 o'clock. It's the most high at 12 to 1 o'clock. 
you have a circadian rhythm. Sometimes you're more active at certain times in the day than you are at certain times at night. We have a circadian rhythm. We, we, there's a lot in it, but a lot of this religion stuff is to keep people ignorant, stupid, and scared of their own shadow, but then think they're worshiping a God, which is just interesting. But the most high is when the sun is at the highest time of the day, which is the zenith, which will be about 12, one o'clock. All right. Most cultures at 12, one o'clock, they have a siesta, fiesta, because it's too hot. But anyway, we'll leave that. We'll come back to that, break down all these little things another time. All right, let's keep going. Let's move on. Let's move on. So I just want to point out one more thing about this. So uh, since for the sun rose directly after the vernal equinox, the festival to be correct in a pagan point of view had to be associated with the new moon. So it had to be relegated and governed by the new moon. We see um, new moon associated with many religions and even sacrifices used to take place on new moons which is interesting and then you have also the connection towards Aya or Yah and this new moon concept all right let's continue Saint John the Divine in his revelation has made Christ Jesus say I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty the first and the last Hindu scripture also makes Krishna the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We read it in the Gita, where Krishna is reported to have said, I myself never was not. Learn that he by whom all things were formed, meaning himself, is incorruptible. I am eternity, non-eternity. I am before all things and the mighty ruler of the universe. So you can find in the Hindu text the same motif, the same language of I am, I am this, I am that. I am this, I am that. Not only that, when you go to the Egyptian text, I'll, uh, I wish I'll put it in here, but I'll find it for you. Um, Osiris or Horus, he refers to himself as I am. I am this. In fact, he always says I am this and I am that. I am this and I am that. When you're saying Shabbat Shalom or shal Shalawam or Shalom or Shalim or whatever you're saying, you're actually invoking a Canaanite deity. Don't be scared now because it's not really what you think it is. Essentially, the Shalam or Shalim or Shalawam or whatever you want to call it was just peace. You, you're calling on the, you might as well be saying Zeus. You know, when you're saying Shalawam and Shalawam and Shala this and Shala that, you, you just, you might as well say, hey Zeus or something like that. Because essentially that's all you're doing. That's not to scare people out of saying this or not saying that. I'm just trying to get you to see and stop being so scared of everything. All right. Now, that's interesting that you can find this I am reference literally in the in the hindu text in the egyptian text all right the scriptures were in the hands of the clergy only and they had every opportunity to insert whatsoever they pleased thus we find them full of interpolations johann shlomo semler one of the most influential theologians of the 18th century speaking of this says the christian doctors notice doctors they love to say doctor in it dr luke and dr this and dr that the Christian doctors never brought their sacred books before the common people. Although people in general have been wont to think otherwise, during the first ages they were in the hands of the clergy only. What did he say? Dot, dot, dot. All right. Interesting. We got man like James Scott. People are lying to people every Shabbat Shalom, you know. They have, they have you in Shabbat Shalom mode all your life. Which, again, there are genuine people who genuinely don't know that this thing is myth. But it gets to a point where you get to a fork in a road and it's like, okay, if it's myth, it can't be looked at as if it's historical. Because that's nonsense. If it's historical, it must be looked at as if it's historical. Because that's sensible. But it can't be both. You understand? So that's interesting how the scriptures was kept among the clergymen, not among the common people, but yet they had the audacity to give the common people common prayer at certain times. This is why in the book of Psalms, you, you see a lot about degrees. A degree is a right angle, a right angle, <laughs> a right angle, angle, angel. So you see a lot of this stuff in the scriptures, but it wasn't to be given to the common people. It was just to be used as a tool to control the common people. 
Essentially, it was just about tithing, building, building up the temple, building up the nation. There's a lot of building because the Masons wanted money for the building fund so they could build more buildings. The builders get paid, the priest gets paid, groundskeeper Willie gets paid to maintain the building. It's an elaborate building scheme. But let's continue, let's advance. So, why did Lord Krishna curse Samba? He decided to teach Samba a lesson. He lured Samba to the private bathing pool where his stepmother were taking baths. Finding intrusion on their privacy, they all complained to Krishna. Krishna was mortified to learn that his son had been peeping and cursed him to suffer from leprosy. So in the, in the, in the Krishna events, he heals people with leprosy, even curses people with leprosy. We see in the scriptures, Elisha heals someone with leprosy and curses someone with leprosy. Interesting. Who did Krishna forgive a hundred times? In the Mahabharata, Shishipula, <laughs> sorry for butchering the names here, the mother of Shu Lajrava persuaded her nephew Krishna that he would pardon his cousin, cousin Shishu Shupala for a hundred offences. A hyperbolical number to exaggerate a point. I don't think you have, you got to walk around with a hundred and, and check it. It's just an exaggerated term. But do we find the same exaggerated term about forgiveness and forgiving people X amount of times? Just something to think about. In Rome, before the time of Christ, a festival was observed. In, in Rome, before the time of Christ, a festival was observed on the 25th of December under the name of Natalius Solius Invicti, birthday of the soul, the invincible. So birthday of the sun, the invincible. Again, I want you to look into Sol Oman. Solomon is a made up character too, unfortunately, whether you want to call him Suleiman in the Arab world or Solomon in the Hebrew Christian world, he's an invented character too. Anyway, so is Sheba. That's another story. We'll get into that. So, under the name of Natalius Solius Invicti, birth of the soul, the invincible, it was a day of universal rejoicing, illustrated by illuminations and public games. All public business was suspended. Declarations of war and criminal executions were postponed. Friends made presents to one another, and the slaves were indulged with great liberties. So this was a good day. This day of the sun, this veneration of the sun, day was a day where... Can we say as much for what is termed the religion of Christ? No. This religion has had the aid of the sword and firebrand, the rack and thumbscrew. I knew that would upset people when I said that, you know. No, I'm not endorsing December the 25th and I'm not demonizing December the 25th. December the 25th is just the day that is just the shortest day of the year based on the constellations. That's all it is. You can be fearful of a day, happy of a day, it's your life. Be happy of a day and hate a day. That's up to you. But it's still going to be a day regardless. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's still going to be a day regardless. Yeah? It was spread by the sword and then thanks killing. You understand? So, interesting nevertheless. And then if there was an Indian that might have said, you know what, I don't really like this whole bible thing that you're trying to give me i've got my own little system based on the constellations you devil satan uh! that's what the missionaries would do to that person the indian man just like bro you do your little system i have my little system you know your system's evil because the bible says well my book says your system's evil well my book's better than your book because it's king james but king james is a, he's a bisexual <laughs> i won't even go there but you understand what's going on this religion was the firebrand of colonialism. This religion was the thing that would shut people up. When I say religion, I mean the book. There's things in the book that were used to do all manner of things in God's name. The God of the Bible, the God of the Quran, the God of Abraham. A lot of colonization was done in this name of this deity. But Constantine the Emperor was the first to check free thought, stop people from being able to challenge the church, mark those. That's why you find these things in the scriptures, mark those who do this against the this and the that. It's safeguarding. The, the church writers are not stupid. They're very proactive and preemptive. They're putting things in the scripts that when people challenge them, they can't challenge them because you can't bring a railing accusation against the elder. You understand? If I, I got a 
on that same note, I'll share a, a quote from Benny Hinn, where Benny Hinn says, you shouldn't blame any pastor even if they're doing all kinds of sin. And we've been conditioned to think like that. Let's continue. Let's advance. And also, sin. What is sin? Another question. I'm not saying there's not badness, but what is sin? Sin is a god in the Mesopotamian pantheon. His name is called Sin. We'll get into that one too. Let's continue. Let's advance. So, Thomas William Dowen was an American scholar, writer, known for his work, biblical criticism, and religious studies. He's the most notable, he's, he is most notable for his uh, book, Bible, Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions. This is 1800s. A lot of things started to take place post-1800s. The religion became very synchronized, very one world orderish, one world order, or you get taken out. He is most notable for his work, Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions, published in 1882. In this work, Dowain examined biblical stories and compared them with myths and legends from other ancient cultures, highlighting that many biblical narratives and parallels, many biblical narratives had parallels in earlier religious tradition. Academic focus. Dowain's work focused on comparative religion and biblical criticism he explored the similarities between the Bible and other ancient mythologies, suggesting that many biblical stories had roots in pre-existing myths from other cultures. Controversial views. His approach was controversial for its time. He challenged the traditional religious view and sought to demonstrate that many biblical stories were not unique, but shared with other ancient traditions. This is the thing as well. When people are saying one supreme God, do you know that even if you go to the Hebrew book, it says God made us in his image, male and female. That means there must be a male and female counterpart. Or unless the creator is androgynous, he has two bits and pieces. Yeah. When you go to the old, old world before this Abrahamic, Christian, uh, Islamic stuff, every nation had a pantheon which had a woman and a man, a god and a goddess, a husband and a wife. And those husband and the wife had children. Every nation had that until they started to bring this Abrahamic father, father, patriarch system where it just got rid of the woman over time and then demonized the woman and just said the woman this and the woman that and the woman this and the woman that. But then you have John who loves Jesus. You have David who loves Jonathan and you have Judas who kissed Jesus. And then you have to greet each other with a brotherly kiss. So it's just very interesting how it's like very male, male bromance, but then very demonizing to women. It's just very, very weird. But anyway, we'll continue. I've probably got two more slides left. Now, nah, summary. So the Bible stories are not unique or original. Abrahamic characters are based on solar or lunar myths. Stories can be found in other places. No one believes in the tooth fairy when they find out it's not true or factual. Now, one of the stories or one of the most underrated miracles, in my opinion, isn't the parting of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds. And interestingly, if it isn't the Red Sea and it's the Sea of Reeds, the Sea of Reeds is no way comparable to the Red Sea. So if it was the Sea of Reeds, as people are trying to redirect and change the route and make it go to some uh, South Africa or this place in Africa or that place in Africa to Afrocentric it. Um, if it is the Sea of Reeds, it's not a big party trick then. That's like, that's not the best thing ever. Like that's very low key, low budget. Obviously, the, the Red Sea is high budget. That's very low budget. So that's a very low budget miracle to do that. That's not the best. But one of the most underrated miracles is the clocks. Because for 40 years, the clothes or sandals never worn out. Walking around that much, doing that much mileage, and the clothes and sandals never wore out. That is a miracle in and of itself. I think that needs more ratings in the mythology, to tell the truth. So Bible, copy and paste. Where is your faith, son? We looked at, to begin with, is the Bible copy and paste? I've shown you previously where you can find a lot of these stories that you might think is unique in other places. From Lot's wife, to the creation of Adam and Eve, to the ascension of Jesus, to Solomon going to divide the baby in two, 
to Moses in the basket. The lot of them. Big up James Scott, he says, big up bro, you motivated, re-evaluate a lot of this so-called history. I started reading in the destruction of black civilization and immediately saw many parallels within the Hyksos and these myths. 100%. Another thing as well, you know, people, don't be, do what you want to do, but just remember, you know, man is not lying, you know. <laughs> Look into the things yourself and see, bro. I just couldn't get over that the, the whole Moses character's made up, bro. Because if the Moses character's made up, and Jesus says, Moses bears witness of me in the trilogy of the Hebrew mythology, then that is just like, yo, what go on with that? Moses ain't real, but Moses bears witness of you. Then that means you're not real too? What? You get me? And then you start to click, like, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. If there is no exodus, you got big grown people with their suitcases packed, waiting for some second exodus into some wilderness to be led by some Moses type figure. It's not happening, mate. It never happened the first time. It's not happening the second time because it's based on myth. So you have grown people being induced by the TV, by Netflix, by mores, by past the prophets in falsehood and just pure lie and filth. And that's what hurts the most to see people being lied to. You tell them the truth and they think you're lying to them. I'm saying really look into the facts, bro. Look into facts. Come out of belief. Stop being R. Kelly all the time. I believe I can fly. I believe this, I believe that. What is the facts though? What is the facts? And that's where we need to go. You understand? But with that being said, me done, me done. Big up, bless up, one. Where Israel was in Egypt there. <laughs> this is just retarded. Sound and logical.